Okay, today we're going to continue talking about other things related to speech production theories and models. Okay, and today we're going to focus on another model in addition to the one we have discussed before. Okay, the one we discussed before, it is called Weaver Double Plus Model. Now, the other model that is proposed by Dell, as we're going to see later on, is called the Spreading Activation Model of Speech Production. Right? Now, before we move into this other model, okay, we try to do a small recap. Okay, can we recapitulate? The Weaver Double Plus Model. What did we learn about that model? Yes, please. Raise your hands. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. The Weaver Double Plus model. Yeah. <coughs> Do you need to go back to remember? The book? Yes? Can you close your books? Close your books. Can you close your computers? Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Now, let's use your memories, okay? Because maybe one of the disadvantages of using technology and pens and whatever tools for teaching is that the memory of the student tends to go for some sleep. Okay? Yes, please. The Weaver Da Plus model. Can you? Yes, I'm not going to look at the figures for the people raising hands. I will notice people who are not raising hands. Yes. Uh -huh. yes, yes, I want to update you. Can you start? Yes. Can you start? Yes. Can you start? Yes. Can you start? Yes. About the way we it's produce them. But it's not, it's not uh, that direct or that, that simple. So it is a, it is a complex process. Which we what are the features of this complex process? Uh, first, uh, we start by uh, conceptualization of the. Right. Of what we want to produce. Yes. And uh -huh. then we, we, we try to activate the, to, to activate the, the right. Lemon. Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then in the next stage, yes. yes. Okay. Yes. First of all, is a concept. Then leads to the activation of certain genes on the the, the the and there is only one. Yes, one, and the application of. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, 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 yes. We want to go in coding. Yes. 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 Which leads to, uh, to, to the decoding of this uh, lemmas, the phonological mm -hmm. encoding, which leads to cellular identification. Uh, yes, the phonological encoding involves the cellular identification of the phonemes. Okay. Okay. Yes, and then we finish with uh, uh, articulation and the vocal okay, yes. gestures, right? Okay, any other things, anything other elements new apart from this? See if you have read. If you have read the chapter and if you have read the sections, there is a difference between this model, which is the Weaver Dow Plus model, in the way it works, as is suggested by the psycholinguists there. Okay? And the other model which we are going to talk about today. There is one element in which they differentiate. 
So that's it. You have spoken about the components, and I think most of you can digest this uh, quite well. But there are some details we need to go to, and these details, we can go to them when we compare between the we Without Class model and this new model, okay, which I want to speak about today. This is pretty, yeah, by yeah. Yes, right. I think the difference between this model and the other is the, it has to do with the, uh, the lemma. Which lemma we are going to activate? Mm -hmm. One of the, the seven is the way plus plus. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, in terms of the activation of the lemma? Yeah. So can you explain? Can you be more concrete? There is something wrong with the activation of the lemma. Okay. What is this wrong thing about the activation of the lemma? Yes? I guess yeah, yeah, one of the weaknesses of the or the uh, issue which was addressed uh, to the over is that sometimes there is a conflict of different things mm -hmm. when when we uh, are in the concept conceptualizing stage mm -hmm. there are different lemmas trying to conflict. Which lemma yeah which one yes what, what I understood from what I read is that um, the Built and these and these colleagues. So when they when they came up uh, with this uh, waiver process, is that they they say that for each concept or for each word, there is a, a specific lemma that should be activated. Okay, so there is a kind of separation between the lemmas for each concept. Whereas for uh, for the spread activation, there is the interchangeability between uh, so words can interfere with each yes. other. Yes, right. That's why they say that in 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 level they say that. Because there is this separation, we tend to have a slip of tongues or mistakes in, yeah. in articulation because sometimes we, we, we choose the wrong, we activate the wrong thing. Whereas for the expert and activate, they say no, okay? So uh, words are, are sometimes uh, interchangeable in terms of, and, or they use one lemma, okay? Yes. And from that one lemma, we tend to activate a specific cell amplification of the Right, so you are. Almost there. You are there, but you that's what I mean. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There is this idea of selection of one lemma, and then a new model uh, proposes an interchangeability kind of link between between different types of lemmas. There is this idea, and we're going to explain it further. Yes. Yes. So let's recapitulate. There is uh, the components which you have spoken about now. Okay, so the We Without Blood describes a set of mental representations that is involved in speaking, which are mental representations. Remember this, very important. It's mental representations. Okay, and these mental representations are concepts. That's the conceptual. Okay, component, lemmas, which you have spoken. I think now you understand these components quite well. Then there is the syllabified metrical representations which involve phonemes and so on, okay? Then the gestural score, okay? The uh, vocal apparatus starts operating on the basis of what you have done as selections and activations, okay? Uh, these three different types of levels, right? Other features, it also assumes a specific kind of information flow. And here we are starting this uh, feature where the Weaver Dow Plus model differs from the new model we're going to speak about today. It's in relation to this, and Cesar Caria has started mentioning this idea, okay? It also assumes a specific kind of information flow as people go from activated concepts to activated lemmas to activated sets of celebified phonemes. There is a specific kind of flow of information and processing. It's linear. Yes, it's forward. We're going to use a, the correct word. It is a forward uh, type of model for this processing. Okay? The model claims a strict, and here it is, the model claims a strict feed forward. Feed forward. There is the word feed, and there is word forward. Because when you are thinking a concept, lemma, and what are you doing? You are feeding. 
concept, and then from the concept you are feeding the lemma, and then the lemma chooses, and then this lemma goes to cell amplification and so on, and chooses. There is a forward feeding process. Okay? Forward feeding process, which is very important. And no, and here comes the difference, and no inhibitory links between representations at a given level of representation. There is no interchangeability. Things are separated. The lemma separated from the concept, separated from the phonological component, and so on. These are separated, and there is only one direction going forward. Okay? Let's go on. Mutual inhibition means that as one mental representation gains activation, it sends signals that reduce the activation of other representations. So when you select something, a concept, so it tells, it sends another uh, signal. It says, ah, oh, this is the word, don't keep fighting with other words, forget about them. And then it goes on to the next process, lemma. And then it's to give signal. You choose the lemma, the grammatical form, the word, the lexicon, etc. And then it tells the others, no, go away now, we don't need you, go. We go forward. We go feed and forward. So we go into phonological processing. So this is what we mean by mutual inhibition. Mutual inhibition means that as one mental representation gains activation, it sends signals that reduce the activation of other representations. So there is some kind of uh, separation. Okay? There is no, so nothing like this. There is, yeah, there is something goes in this selection of this. Then you go to the next level, it tells this, then you select. Then the phonological, you select. One, 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 one. But we're, with the next model we're going to see today, there is a kind of interchangeability link existing between, uh, and there is another kind of feed, different from this one we have here. Here we have a feed forward processing, and the other one we have the reverse. We have the two of them, feed forward and back. The operation goes in this way between all types of things feed forward. You go for, you, you, and then you feed forward and then it goes back and then analysis and then goes forward then goes forward again, back and the things go on uh, in this way. So, production begins with a set of activated concepts according to the Weaver Plus. This leads to activation of a set of lemmas before phonological sound information can be activated, one of those lemmas must be selected for further processing. One selected, then goes into phonological processing. We continue. The phonological encoding system only works on the one lemma that gets selected. And this is what Zakaria has mentioned. So there is a selection of one. There is no different choices or whatever. It doesn't work on different choices at the same time. It works only on one level selected, on one, one thing selected, okay? Weaver Dow Plus model falls within the feed-forward class of processing models. It's okay, this is the type of model we have here, the Weaver Dow Plus, it's feed-forward processing. It's a kind of repetition, I'm not adding anything new here. I just I try to use different expressions to, you know, to repeat and explain further. It's taken from the book, by the way, okay? This is just from the book. Because information only, only moves in one direction in the system, from concept to lemmas to lexemes to phonemes. The system does not allow activation to feed back in the opposite direction. And here comes the difference between this Weaver Plus model and the next model we're going to speak about today. Lexemes may not feed back and influence the activation of lemmas. Okay? And lemmas may not feed back and influence the activation of concepts. And the same thing for the phonological component. It may not feed back to lemmas and etc. Now, the new model, which is uh, proposed by Dell 1986 and Dell et al. 1997, it states that information is allowed to flow both in feed-forward direction, which is the case for the Weaver Dow Plus model, and in a feedback direction opposite to Weaver Dow Plus model. Here we have the two uh, directions. Not only one direction as it exists for Weaver Dow Plus, feed-forward. Now, there is feed-forward, 
And there is also feed backward. All right? Activation is allowed to cascade through the system. It goes to whatever it wants. Information or activation, it can go back, it can go forward, and keeps going that, okay, throughout the speech production system, the speech production, okay? In Weaver Down Plus, selection has to take place at one level of the system. Um, blocked. It's one. We are in the concept, so we are blocked in there. We don't go any other way. Then we go to the little limas. We are blocked there. We don't go back. We, we have to wait until we go forward. Then when we want to phonological component, we are blocked in there, and we don't go any further back, but we wait for the next step, which is forward. But for this one, no phonemes get activated till lemma selection is complete. This is the same thing for for the uh, Weaver Dow Plus model, okay? No phonemes get activated till lemma selection is complete. In Dell's spreading activation model, as soon as activity begins at one level, as soon as activity begins at one level, activation spreads because things are interrelated. Okay, cascading, okay? Thus, selection doesn't necessarily occur at one level before activity is seen at the next. This is due to the fact that this model assumes feedback, okay, feedback between levels of representation. And I, if you remember the video, talks about this, this idea of going back and forward, okay? And here it is repeating this model. So this is due to the fact that this model assumes feedback between levels of representation. If the lemma, example, if the lemma for cat gains some activation, it is uh, activated, it will feedback to the concept layer it, there is this possibility. In the Weaver Dow Plus model, there is no such possibility. Once it is activated, I don't go back anymore to the concept. Yes, we go forward. But for this model, it will feed back to the concept layer and reinforce analysis going on and reinforces this selection. Okay? In order to go to the next step. If the phonological information associated with the pronunciation cat begins to be activated, now I'm at the phonological component, I'm starting activating the phonemes, what happens? It will feed back to the lemma, okay, in order to reinforce the activation of the cat lemma. You see? This is, the, you just remember it in this way. The, the weaver, it's a feed forward operation only. It's a processing only, but in this one, it's a feed forward and backward. It keeps doing this, okay, until we have the, yes. Feedback, now, I don't need to ask you maybe <laughs> what do we end to mean by lexical bias effect, okay. So, feedback connections from the phonological sound processors to the lemma abstract word form level can help Okay, the lexical bias effect. Anybody can tell? What is the lexical bias effect? It's in your chapter. Yes, please. Maybe it's the choice of the correct lexical item. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is this idea of choice. Mm -hmm. Okay. The lexical bias effect refers to the fact that when people produce some exchange errors, here we are going back to the stories of okay, exchange errors, more, than, more often than not, the thing that they actually produce is a real word. Whenever people make errors, they don't make errors uh, producing some, something that doesn't exist in the language. They produce words that exist. 
that go according to the grammatical patterns, according to the morphological patterns, according to the phonological patterns, phonetic patterns that are existing in the language system. You don't have something not existing, okay? And this is what is called the lexical bias effect, okay? The lexical bias effect refers to the fact that when people produce sound exchange errors, you remember the sound exchange errors? Okay, you remember, for example, feed, okay, text, you have sound exchange errors. You have a word and then, uh, yeah, the sound is exchanged by another one, okay? So when we have this, more than, more often than not, the thing that they actually produce is a real word. Speech errors, it's a explanation, further explanation of this point of lexical bias. Speech errors almost never violate phonotactic constraints. They never follow, okay? For example, you will never have a word in English, for example, uh, having more than three phonemes or four phonemes in a row. We, why? Because English doesn't accept this, phonologically speaking. You never have phonemes, sounds, consonants, four consonants in a row. Do you? It doesn't exist because the system does not accept this. There are other languages that do have this. Okay? So, for example, when we have sound exchange errors produced by some people, they will never, ever violate this constraint. Okay? And this is what is referred to as the lexical bias effect. The lexical bias effect, it's, it refers to the fact that when people produce sound exchange errors, they will produce words. Okay? Maybe that's not what they meant, but they will produce correct grammatical words, phonological words, okay? And they create real words more often they should, than they should purely by chance, okay? And this is the uh, schematic uh, overview of this model. And you can see the interchange, interrelationship existing between all the levels, and you can see that the things go back and forward, keep going back and forward, so complex, okay? And maybe this is what explains, they rely on this, okay? The idea of lexical bias effect in order to come up with this theory. There is this idea of lexical bias effect, why? Because things in the speech production process are so much interrelated, they keep going forward, and keep going backward and do this, this, this analysis. How oh, phonological system is okay? No, go, go back. Uh, things go on, and then therefore, when if they ever produce a, an error, they will produce it still according to grammatical constraint, according to phonological constraint, according to morphological constraint, because of this complex analysis of things going on in the process. Okay, which goes forward and back, keeps going that uh, all the time. Now, the interactive, this is the uh, way it's called, the interactive uh, spreading activation accounts explains the lexical bias effect by appealing to feed forward and feed feedback, uh, feedback links between lemmas and phonological output mechanisms as shown in opposite figure. Okay? This idea of lexical bias effect, these people or who have Bell who has relied, who has postulated this theory, he relies on this kind of, of, uh, of phenomenon existing in uh, uh, speech errors, okay, in order to advocate. So remember, for the weaver, we have relied on a number of things in order uh, how the psycholinguists uh, provide theories. We remember tips of the tongue, uh, tips of the tongue, cement, uh, so, so phonological substitution, etc. okay? Now these people, Dill, who proposes at all, who proposed this theory, this uh, new theory, or, or this new model of speech production process, they rely on this phenomenon of lexical bias effect, and they tell you, we have this phenomenon, why? Because we have this kind of feed forward feedback uh, processing of the language, yes. Can, can we apply this really the Yeah, that's a, that's another way of explaining that. We have this, okay? 
That's a kind of phenomenon that can be added to justify this theory. There is idea of feedback processing, okay? And here we are talking about one person. I am speaking, and then when I'm speaking, uh, I say something, and then I recognize, oh, sorry, it's not this word, it's this word. Why? Because it's, uh, in some few seconds, you do that, okay? It's like electrical, uh, yeah. Uh, can you say that there is a monitor yes. just before the actual production of the sound. Sometimes I have an idea, and at the time when I want to run, to articulate it, I stop. I stop consciously mm -hmm. and with my own will and reconsider my That's right. and go back everything from the beginning. Yes, that's right. It's the same uh, kind of thing. It's the same. Yes, yes. Self monitoring. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, self monitoring. Okay, so it's exactly that's what we mean by uh, by this. Yes. Sometimes it happens that uh, someone is like uh, somebody is speaking, and then like you think of an idea, and then you, even you start like producing a word. Then when you reach the, like half the word, then you stop, and then you. Yeah, yeah that's right. And remember, like remember, we are still talking about individual words. So I want you to take into account these things when you are speaking. And so many words going on. So you can hear how complex it is. Okay, so that's, uh, this is one way how uh, this can be described. But it's not the case with deaf people. That's why when people who are deaf speaking, they cannot monitor themselves. The auditory apparatus is not working. Yeah, that's a kind of... Uh, Exceptions, okay? Those are exceptions due to uh, damages. I don't know, okay? We're going to speak about these uh, uh, exceptions in relation to uh, limitations of the Lima theory in the next uh, PowerPoint. I'm going to talk about the limitations of the Lima theory and we're going to speak about uh, brain damages and the cases of brain damages and how the types of problems uh, happening there they provide some uh, criticism for the Lima theory, okay? And uh, uh, deaf people is one example of that. Uh, I want somebody please to go to page uh, 49 to resume all of this. I want somebody near me, okay? Okay, Yunus, can you read it? Passage 49. Let me have my book. There are two patches in there. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Slip, uh, figure uh, 2.1. Yeah. Slip Clip in place of the target lips. Lip is far more likely than clip or lip. This is the beginning of the paragraph. Okay. Interactive screen. Are you all in there? Wait, see you next, please. We want the others to follow with you. So you have the paragraph starting with interactive spreading activation. So it's a recap, okay? It's, I have explained that, okay? And I'm just trying to repeat, okay, for further. Uh, Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, interactive spring activation accounts. Example, Dell 1986. Dell A. Hello. Yeah. Do you, remember, do you know what he meant by this? Dell yes. A. Yes. yes. And other researchers with him who have produced one book, yeah. co author within yes. one book. Yes. Explain the lexical bias effects by appearing to feed forward and feed the links between lemmas and chronological output mechanisms. Figure 2 3 shows how these two sub processes, uh, processors might be co connected, there and others. In this kind of model, phonological activation begins as soon as, soon as Lima's words in the diagram began to be activated. Okay, so you have words begin to be activated. So, what happens as, okay, in this kind of model, phonological activation begins as soon as Lima's which are represented by the term words in there, okay, uh, begin to be activated, but before a final candidate has been chosen. Now, let's go on, okay? It's not, it doesn't stop in there, okay? We, are not, we don't stop just in words. What happens next? At the same but time? Uh, but before a final candidate has been chosen, as individual phonemes begin to be activated, they send feedback yes. To the limas that they are connected to, increasing the activity, the activation of the limas. Okay, so here, so we are here in words, and now we are moving to uh, 
phonemes, phonological component. Now, before we activate anything, we say anything, okay, using the vocal apparatus, there is one thing that should go, should take place before we do that, which is feedback. In order to make sure, yes, is this the real word I want to talk about? Yeah, then it moves on to, once it's confirmed here, when we go back here, so you see the thing, we go back. And then it's confirmed, then we have, for example, onset or whatever, kind of, oh, what is the word here? Oh, okay, yeah, okay, those are just for me. Yes, go on. Uh, but real words have representation at the nearest level, and none words do not. It is likely the mistaken activation among the phonemes will reinforce the activation of a word that sounds like the intended target word. It is less likely that none word errors will result. It is less likely when we do all this, okay, we keep doing this, there is a, it is less likely, you know what it means, it's less likely? It's not very likely, it's very rare. Less likely that a non-word error will result. We will have something which, uh, it's a word, accepts, the, uh, respects the system, okay? Yes. Uh, because any set of phony that would lead to a non-word being produced will not enjoy and reinforce any reinforcement, any reinforcement, any reinforcement activation from the lemma's level. That's okay, so here there is another term that I want you to keep in mind in this model, in this part, in this model, which is the idea of reinforcement. That's why there is the idea of feedback. Okay? Why do we feedback? Because I want to reinforce what I have selected. Okay? Reinforce. You know what you mean by reinforce, okay? You will make sure that something it is the okay, case, it's true, correct. So, this concept is also important when you talk about this model. Don't you? Thus, for average sets of phonemes that produce one word will be less activated than sets of phonemes that produce real words. Okay, so that's the, uh, this is the uh, model. Okay? Good. Now, another phenomenon we need to talk about in relation to this model is what is referred to by mixed errors. Anybody? Should I ask you again or should I go? Maybe I should ask again. Mixed errors. In a mixed error, the word that a person produces by mistake is related in both meaning and sound to the intended word. You know, the idea of uh, semantic uh, relatedness, okay? Uh, when you, uh, in a mixed error, the word that a person produces by mistake, for example, you are speaking about food, you are going to come up with a word which is wrong, but still belongs to the food category. Yeah, in terms of meaning, okay? Spreading activation uh, accounts of such of speech production view the relatively high likelihood of mixed errors as resulting from cascading activation and feedback processes between levels. This is another phenomenon used by these psycholinguists talking about this model. They use it in order to propose that there is feed forward and feedback in the speech production system. Why? Because look, when you are, if there is no feedback, there is very, maybe there should be probability, more probability for producing other words which are not really related to each other. But because they are the words which are errors or the errors we produce, and then we produce words that are semantically related, which means that when we are uh, processing things in the speech production, we go back, we keep going back, going forward and going back in order to make sure that I come up with the most likely correct word, okay? Now, can you, somebody else, uh, read? Uh, I need somebody from uh, next to me. Yes, uh, Sumia? Do you have the following paragraph, the following paragraph. It talks about mixed errors, okay? So okay, so this is what I have taken. I just take this and then put it in my slide. Okay. 
So a person is more likely to say lobster, for instance, when they mean to say oyster, than they are to say octopus. Because lobster both sounds like and has a similar meaning to the tiger. So you see here? Instead of saying lobster, maybe the guy or the person speaking can say oyster, which is semantic related to lobster, but never say something like octopus or talking about a completely different semantic field. Okay? Yes? Further, these types of mixed errors appear more frequently than they should if errors were pure derivative. Okay, so further, further, these types of mixed errors, mixed errors occur more frequently than they should if errors were purely Random, okay, yes? Spread and activation accounts of speech production yield relatively high likelihood of mixed errors as resulting from cascade activation and feedback processes between levels. Thinking about oysters will activate semantically related items such as, such as lobster and octopus, mm -hmm. which will lead to activation of the oyster lemma, but also lobster and octopus lemmas. Activating the oyster, lobster, and octopus lemmas will cause. Mm -hmm. Feed forward activation of the sounds that make up those words because the stress set of phonemes is more driven by both the target and the active computer level. Those sounds are highly likely to be selected for eventual output. Sounds that occur only in the target or only in a computer are less likely to be selected. If there were no cascading activation, so, so this is important. If there were no cascading activation, I don't need to, to spend again cascading or feedback or feed forward. Either mm -hmm. or lobster would have about an equal chance of output completing the target oyster. Mm -hmm. But the and lemma liars, and there is no reason why lemma liars would not have the so, to summarize all this, so let me go back to, uh, to this. So, spreading activation accounts of speech production view the relatively high likelihood of mixed errors as resulting from cascading activation and feedback process. That's why mixed errors, they produce Okay, uh, we have errors in which we produce a word that is semantically related to what I want to talk about. Okay, why? Because there is idea of feed forward, feed fed, feedback, feed forward, feedback. So there is going on. Okay, well, and then there is the idea of reinforcement as well, which I talk to you about. Okay, good. So any uh, thing you want to uh, add to this? Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> is it possible to have in mixed errors <laughs> an error in which there is no semantic uh, uh, semantic relatedness, but there is there should be, of course, a phonological relatedness. For example, I want to say the word uh, octopus, and I say octopus. For example, <coughs> I just changed the letters, but octopus does not exist in English. So this is a possibility. Why? Well, so here it talks about meaning. Okay. Here, uh, according to what I have read and so on, it talks about meaning-related words. We are not talking about grammatical meaning, okay? Yes? There is phonological relatedness, but no semantic one. It's not a mixed error. Mixed errors, we talk about meaning, okay? Mixed errors, we focus on meaning-related words, okay? But uh, concerning your uh, your uh, point, well, what do you have as uh, do you have any uh, ideas to talk about this story? No. Before we go to another question, this, uh, yes. I think I joined the Similarity in terms of meaning, because for example, 
So that's why uh, I'm telling uh, the so when we are talking about mixed errors, we are talking about words that are semantically related. But once you go further into a uh, phenomenon related to phonology, so we start talking about slips of the tongue, uh, phonological substitution, etc. So we're talking about another component. Here, we, we talk about words, wrong words, that have a uh, relationship with the words that I normally should use uh, in terms of meaning. Okay? Yes, please. Which one is, is logical? What do you think? Second, second one. Mm -hmm. Why the second one? Raise your hands. Yes, now Omar, uh, uh, Omar Kali? Because I think that it's something that you experience in your everyday speech. When yeah. you speak, sometimes you try to go backward in order to make sure that this is, especially if you are, if you are not a native speaker of the language, yeah, you tend to experience this more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes? Maybe there is another good historical reason, which is that generally the older theories are limited and the newer one come in as a response to the first ones. Yes. So the older ones, they, they come up from scratch, from nothing at all. Yeah. So there, there might be a lot of mistakes, but the, 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 uh, the problem the ones, they base yeah. a little bit themselves on the first Yes, ones. the historical development, this has to do with the historical development of theories, okay? Yes, see, uh, Akhalas? I believe that we cannot say this is logic and this is logic. Mm -hmm. I think it's just not just for our argument. It's for a way of plus plus it. Uh, if the motion goes uh, through that uh, model at the beginning of the, uh, when developing means uh, developing one's language in general. Mm -hmm. But it has to do, uh, and, uh, and, and as you know, uh, the, 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 the communication sector, you develop a second one in which, uh, in order to, uh, re, uh, to reach what we call the my presentation today, automatically. So you need you can we don't think about concept first, then we think about homology, then we think about the meaning, etc. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is done, but it's very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. When you when develop means when you through daily communications again, okay, you come up with new new new, new model. Mm -hmm. So, you think that the second model is most uh, yeah, probable? It's, it's an advanced, advanced yeah, it's more developed uh, theory. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Same again with reading. Yeah, we're going to see talk about written. Yeah, we're going to talk about written input. I think to understand this you can draw this kind of analogy between visuals and uh, models of reading, for example, of the gut. We have some models of reading and uh, good man. For example, the, uh, the first one is uh, somehow similar to Gaps model of reading because it is also a linear word by word or even later by later process. And it is, uh, it is explained as uh, some deficiencies, so it, it doesn't work because uh, as long as we you know uh, in, in this linear process, we tend to forget uh, uh, to learn from the letters that we recognize uh, first. And the second one is similar to uh, uh, Goodman, which is uh, a kind of sampling, predicting, and so this is a kind of feedback and the reinforcement, the idea of reinforcement can be explained in the confirmation. Yeah, both speak them. They have a lot of things in common, reading and speaking. I think they the same mental processing. Uh, the same in reading, let me go back again, reading classical. So, so just, mm -hmm. just uh, while, when, when we talk about automaticity, for example, the first step, okay. uh, the first step that any, any reader should, uh, should do is that you start by using, by the way, we need to include four, four types of memories again. Uh, the visual memory, for example, then phonological memory, then semantic memory, then another memory. That will result to the meaning that we can wear because it is uh, it is not Okay, so we are going into another field which we will see later on, and I think you are doing this with zero one. So let's go on, okay? And I think uh, in relation to this idea of uh, which theory is makes more sense, yes? Yeah, I, I think that both theories are, are correct and have evidence. And yeah. The, the, the last one, which is the. But which one makes more sense for you? Yeah, it's the second one. Second, second one. one. Uh, it's based on the first one. Yeah, we have for sure. The of the first one, so for sure. Yeah, it's just a compromise between the first one. Right. And uh, it sounds like uh, concrete because we, we feel that, yeah, it happens in that when we speak. Mm -hmm. 
first one sounds like uh, more abstract, but the second one sounds more concrete. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, extremely spelled and it's big. The, the first one uh, is called abstract? Yeah. Somehow but you have things slip of the tongue. Slip of the tongue is, is an abstract phenomenon. Slip of the tongue. It's not a, okay. Sima, uh, phonological substitution is a sima, uh, abstract thing. No, they rely on concrete things. Both theories rely on concrete things to explain conceptual abstract things, which are going in the mind. We never see. Okay. So something I just needed to uh, make this clear. Yes. Why are because, for example, the liberal class plus theory uh, talked about uh, some features of speech production that, that and it brought really a bit of the problem. Yeah. Like the tip of the tongue, like slip of, of the tongue. Whereas the, uh, the second theory, at least, didn't talk about them at all. Mm -hmm. And they are uh, important components of, components of the of, uh, speech production. But they, but they, let me tell you, say this, but they, but they accept the components. They accept, they're relying on the first theory, which means that they accept it. And when they accept it, they accept everything with it, go with it. They only add other explanations for new data. Because they got new data, which are lexical bias effect, and which is on oh, the, the mixed errors phenomenon. They have this new data, and they, they start asking questions. Uh, can this Weaver plus account for this? Uh, new data? No, it doesn't. So therefore, they have started thinking about new ways to explain that. So in order to explain that, so they propose that there is not only one direction in the speech production process. There is a, a feed forward and feedback operation in which there is reinforcement uh, issue. Okay? So, uh, and this is how theory works. Okay, so you have a theory and then it explains some of the data. Then there is new data, go back to the theory, complement it or reject it, and then it goes on. And then we're going to see now in the following PowerPoint presentation that there, are, there, is, there is other data, there is other data, okay? Uh, there are other data in which the uh, come up with uh, problems related to brain damage. And the people who have that brain damage, they come up with some kinds of errors which neither the Weaver plus double model or the DAV model uh, explain. And they even go further into telling that these further concepts, uh, which relies on this lemma theory, okay, etc., lemma component or lexical, mental lexicon. No, how could we explain this new data? So there is this guy, which we're going to see next uh, in a few minutes, presenting this new data and then trying to explain in his own way. Okay, uh, this, uh, yes please, new data. There is something which is very amazing in, in these two theories, both the, the, the spreading theory and the, the uh, Weber plus plus, which is that the human beings are endowed with the capacity, uh, with the ability to do certain things in milliseconds unconsciously, which is really something which is, uh, well, uh, it should be uh, studied. And uh, here, I just ask, ask myself, what is the limit of my conscious here? To what extent can I be conscious of everything that I do? So there are lots of things. Alhamdulillah, that's why I'm not aware of it. <laughs> we don't think of it. Yeah. There are lots of things which, which we, we do every day, but we are not th without thinking of, which are, yeah. which are really perplexing. Yeah. Isn't perplexing, that's why they are kept implicit. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay, so that's the, uh, another issue. Uh, so I think we're going to stop in here, and then we...